The whole idea behind democracy is that the general public should participate in making the decisions that affect their lives. Democracy, like freedom, can take many forms. Even in totalitarian states, there are some freedoms, likewise with a democracy. There are some states, such as Cuba and Iran, that practice small amounts of democracy, and yet, they are limited to a narrow range of options, and most would say they are not democratic at all. There are generally two different types of democracy, representative and direct. However, representative democracy is not democratic. Direct or participatory democracy allows the voice of the public to be heard, unhindered in its purest form. This allows the members to be self-managed without the use of bureaucrats and politicians. I think we can all agree that politicians are corrupt. Every day, someone is being accused of and exposed for their crimes, ranging from perjury to theft of public money. Society should not be forced to choose the best of two evils. The Center for Responsive Politics, the leading nonpartisan organization that records money in politics, found that in the 2008 elections, 93% of the House of Representative races and 94% of the Senate were won by the candidate who spent the most money. This reality is not just reserved for Congress. Barack Obama also outspent all other candidates, including John McCain, to win the presidency. Much of the money that comes from political financing is produced by corporate donations, political action committees, and wealthy individuals. Top industries literally spent billions of dollars to pay for our current Congress. In 2008, there were 14,800 lobbyists who spent $3.3 billion to influence politicians. This is pretty amazing considering there are only 535 members of Congress. This shows that one person, one vote is just a myth. It is money, not people, that decide the fate of elections and our lives. Politicians do not represent the public. Instead, they represent industries who pay for them to be there. In order to win elections, the politicians must hire teams of people who turn them into demagogues, who use certain phrases, dress in certain clothes, use ambiguous forms of speech about ideas that nearly 100% of the public agrees with, such as the right to freedom and democracy. Their speeches are rehearsed, studied, calculated, marketed, spun, and branded. In the meantime, politicians must hide their true motives, personality, vices, and beliefs. Because speeches are so vague, this causes people to interpret them to the point of conspiracy theories. Politicians may be moral as individual people, but by necessity, they must participate in a system which forces them to be dishonest. They cannot act and say what they want to say. Political representatives do not represent society because their actions are geared to appeal to the least common denominator. When they do act, we can see who they truly represent. According to a study from the University of Kansas, big companies that spent hundreds of millions lobbying successfully for tax breaks enacted in 2004 got a 22,000% return on that investment. Even worse are the companies who received money from the TARP bailouts. Those companies received 258,000% for the 114 million they spent on campaign donations and lobbying. Some companies, such as AT&T, give to both political parties in order to hedge their bets and guarantee access to the political realm. In 2008, they gave out 43 million in campaign contributions. 49% of that money went to the Democrats and 51% went to the Republicans. Since 1990, AT&T has given to both political parties close to the same amount. There's a long history of campaign contributors being paid back with government jobs. Recently, Obama has been giving campaign bundlers, people who gather large sums of money for his presidential bid, major diplomatic positions including posts in Spain, Norway, Australia, Luxembourg, and the European Union. Obama has also given other posts to financial bundlers, including the job of Deputy of the United States Trade Representative. He has also posted delegates to the Organization of American States, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, and to the UN Management and Reform. This is routine procedure for both Democrats and Republicans. There is also a history of the government working closely with the business sector, allowing executives to move from the private to the public sector and vice versa. The executives don't stop working for the benefit of the private sector while they are in public office. Companies pay to have access for their own people to sit at the table, creating favors they will receive, usually in the form of regulation and deregulation, tax breaks, and other gifts. While working for the Clinton administration, Robert Rubin helped to merge Citicorp and Travelers by deregulation. After his time with the Clinton administration, he went on to work for the merged company, Citigroup. Today, Robert Rubin is an economic advisor for the Obama administration. Elections are big business. Money always wins. 
The system of democracy should move from the bottom up. Instead, authority flows downward to shape people's thoughts, hopes, attitudes, and beliefs. Politicians tell people what they should think, dream, and who they should hate, fear, and worship. They shape who we are instead of the other way around. To win elections, our representatives acquiesce to money powers and comply to the public relation firms, the front groups, and the powerful think tanks to help manipulate the media. All of these groups collude in vast networks, propagating information and molding public opinion into what moneyed interests deem to be important, making sure that certain issues are not raised by minimizing debate, and attacking any group that threatens their own welfare. The greatest danger the system produces is the narrowing range of political debate. We are told again and again that the political spectrum is no broader than the range of Republican and Democrat, that society can only make decisions that fall into the realm of taxes, abortion, health care, and education. But even these issues fall into a limited range. The political realm has been virtually nullified. There is no meaningful change because the system of representative democracy, by its very nature, demands consistently flat results. It shouldn't be that every two to four years we leave our homes to vote for one of two people to become our representative. This one person is supposed to represent the public will and make decisions for every human being that they represent. It doesn't matter that 63% of Utah didn't vote for Obama or that 58% of New York voted against Bush. They will have to listen and submit themselves to the rule of this human being that they have never met and will never meet. These outcomes are against the very idea of freedom. As President Bush always liked to say, I am the decider. While some people found this statement undemocratic, it is the reality of our nation. All of this is not to say that democracy is inherently evil, but politicians are not representatives or even expressions of human wants, desires, or wishes. It's not that politicians want to be bureaucratic. They are bureaucrats. And it's not like some politicians are demagogues and others not. They all are. They have to be demagogues to win elections. Politicians may not like lying, pretending, spouting catchphrases, or even kissing babies. They have to take money for favors to help large corporations and industries if they want to win. It's easy to see that our politicians are anything but representative of the makeup of our society. Aside from the obvious race and gender gap, these people do not live in the same economic bracket as the rest of society. The personal finances in the House of Representatives averages out to about $5 million, while the typical senator household brings in closer to 16. Jane Harmon of California leads the list with a net worth of almost $400 million. These Congress members are not a composite of American society. They do not live in the same houses as we do. They do not understand what it is like not to have health insurance. They do not understand the daily suffering of ordinary Americans. They don't work regular jobs. Some have never even been a part of the workforce. These so-called representatives fly in private jets, attend parties that we will never attend, eat at restaurants we could never afford, dress in clothes we will never wear, and relax on yachts we will only see in the movies. These people know nothing of our lives and our financial struggles. It has long been known that the Soviet style of economics does not work because a small group of elites cannot know all the intricacies and interactions of an entire functioning economy and society. It's just too complex. Only the people on the ground can have any true understanding of the needs and wants to fulfill their lives and thereby create a society that will fulfill the public's wishes. Our style of democracy shares the same dysfunctional nature as the Soviets. Until we can form new ways of social interaction and decision making, we cannot say we live in a truly democratic society, because representative democracy is not democracy and never has been. Our system of voting takes ordinary people and turns them into immoral politicians. The politicians become corrupt, not because they want to, but because the system requires it. These people cannot be reformed, because the apparatus in which they work does not allow it. Trying to find the best politician is not the answer. The reason why is because politicians should not exist, nor should the system of representative democracy.